Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining the Startup Society's Foundation podcast. Today, we're joined by Colin Grabo. He is a policy analyst at the Cato Institute, and he specializes in trade policy. How are you doing today? Great. Yourself? I'm doing fantastic. Um, you are an expert at the Jones Act. And for our listeners who are not familiar, can you give a rundown of what the Jones Act is? Sure. So the Jones Act is a section of a law called the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. And what this section of the law mandates is that any ship carrying cargo between US, uh, one US port to another has to meet four conditions. These conditions are that the uh, ship has to be built in the United States, it has to be uh, owned by US citizens, crewed by US citizens, and US registered and flagged. This law was passed in 1920, right after World War I. There was a concern that the United States uh, was over-reliant on foreign shipping to meet its defense needs. So in World War I, they needed to transport US men, supplies, equipment uh, over to Europe, and they had to rely on foreign ships to, to some extent to get that done. And there was a fear that in national emergencies that absent this primary the U.S. the domestic build requirement that there wouldn't be an ecosystem there to build ships uh, if the United States w- found itself in another uh, war or other uh, emergency like uh, along those lines. So now that the United States has been a hegemon for about twenty years, navally speaking, what is the reason for keeping the Jones Act in place? So really. That's just it. In my opinion, there is no case for maintaining the Jones Act. Um, From a military perspective, uh, the United States has not lost a ship to enemy action outside of uh, some mines in the Korean War. They haven't lost a ship to enemy action basically since World War II. You know, the, the, the nature of warfare itself has changed dramatically since the Jones Act was passed. Um, You know, Conventional wars that the U.S. fights these days tend to be very short in duration. Not only do we not lose ships during wartime, but even if we want to replace them, you know, by the time you build the ship, the war is already over. Um, we tend to fight, you know, unconventional wars that don't really have a lot to do with with the Jones Act. This is built for a World War type environment uh, that I think no longer applies. Uh, also, there's the fact that, you know, for example, in the World Wars and, and wars of decades ago. You know, U.S. soldiers were transported aboard troop ships. I mean, there is no such thing as a troop ship anymore. They get on airplanes. They go hundreds of miles an hour, you know, above the waves, not you know over the waves. Um, and you know, also the just the uh, the nature of the world has changed in the sense that uh, ships primarily used to be built uh, in the United States, and now. Well, not primarily, but, you know, large numbers of ships were built in the United States. And now ships are increasingly built in Asia, especially cargo ships. So the result is that uh, Japan, China, the Korea, they're very good at building ships. But Americans, if you want to transport goods from one U.S. port to another, you can't buy those ships. So the result is that we have to buy ships built here in the United States, which may sound good. But the result is that we have to pay, you know, sometimes five, six times more uh, for a ship that would otherwise be the case. So if it isn't really a military reason why we've kept the Jones Act, is it more of a public choice? Uh, it's absolutely uh, a public choice issue, yes. Uh, you know, the Jones Act uh, works out very poorly for the majority of Americans. Uh, we all pay the cost of the Jones Act ever so slightly. You know, the cost of transporting goods from point A to point B is slightly higher because we have the Jones Act, because they have to buy these more expensive ships, because they have to crew them uh, with Americans. The, the act's been modified somewhat, so it's 75% American, not 100% American, but still. Um, so they have these higher costs, which get passed along to consumers. Um, and you know, uh, what, meanwhile, the people that benefit from the Jones Act are going to be these shipbuilders, for example. You know, they have kind of a captured market. You have to buy from them, so they have less competition. Uh, also, the unions that, um, that are responsible for representing the laborers, the, the, um, the merchant mariners that staff these ships, of course, they benefit from, again, less competition. They have to worry about foreigners. Um, so they benefit tremendously. And meanwhile, the rest of us, you know, they have the 
concentrated benefits and the rest of us have these, you know, costs, but they're dispersed over 300 and some million Americans. So you mentioned that there's a definite cost to American consumers. Have you looked into the economic consequences for Puerto Ricans who no longer get to have goods shipped to and from their island? Sure. So there's a variety of costs to uh, Puerto Ricans. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York did a study uh, a few years ago. They found, for example, that if you want to ship uh, a container of goods from New York to Puerto Rico, it costs roughly double as if you want to send it to Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic or Kingston, Jamaica. So that speaks to the higher transportation costs. Um, and, you know, being an island uh, that trades extensively with with the mainland United States, a lot of goods ca- come, you know, from from the mainland and are exported from Puerto Rico to the U.S. And all those have to pay higher costs than would otherwise be the case. A couple of Puerto Rican economists a few years ago uh, did a study on this. They came at they arrived at the number of you know five. Oh, it was over five hundred million dollars per year. Uh, as the cost to to Puerto Rico by itself because of the Jones Act. Wow, that's absolutely horrendous. What do you think would be the consequence of repealing the Jones Act for Puerto Ricans? So I think Puerto Ricans would see lower costs uh, for the goods that they purchase every day. Um, you know, if they want to import a car, if they want to just go to the market and buy, you know, pretty much anything. Again, the, the majority of things that Puerto Ricans consume are not produced in Puerto Rico. And so anything imported from the uh, mainland United States costs more than it otherwise would. So they would see, uh, you know, a reduction in, in their expenses. You know, now, the magnitude of that, it's hard to say because Puerto Rico's economy is hurting in so many different ways and has, you know, a myriad of problems facing it. Exactly, you know, what proportion the Jones Act is responsible for is difficult to say with any precision. But like I said, you um, we have that 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 estimate of over five hundred million dollars per year uh, from some Puerto Rican economists. So we can use that as a ballpark figure, and then you know spread that over the the population of Puerto Rico to get some idea of what the benefits might be. When I think about this, it's not just reduction; it's not a reduction of cost for consumer goods, but probably also capital goods as well. So the opportunity cost in Jones Act would be you know increases in production by magnitude. I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not it's not just consumers. I mean, consumers are the ones that, you know, you go to the store, and everything costs a little bit more. But you're right. Uh, Puerto Rico has a poor business environment. It's hard to run a, a company there, again, for a variety of reasons. But the Jones Act figures into that. Um, like you said, capital goods, if you want to set up a factory there, everything you want to import, well, you know, good chance it's going to come from the continental United States, it's going to come from the mainland, and it's going to cost more to bring in. And that just reduces the attractiveness of Puerto Rico as, as a place to do business, which is really unfortunate because, uh, as everybody knows, it needs the help. So what, if, if any at all, uh, attempts have there been made to repeal the Jones Act? So the Jones Act is coming up on its 100-year anniversary, in, in two years. And every now and again, you see some attempts uh, back in the 90s, for example, there are a group of senators, primarily from farm states that wanted, they didn't even want to repeal the Jones Act. They just wanted to say that if you wanted to ship, for example, grains, that you could do it on a non-Jones Act compliant ship. That, uh, you know, that didn't get passed. I don't think it got more than, you know, a half dozen sponsors. Uh, John McCain has been waging a pretty lonely campaign to repeal the Jones Act that's really never gone anywhere. He's also you know, trying to get an exemption for Puerto Rico. Uh, as far as I know, he has the support of Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma, um, which is, you know, that speaks to another aspect of the Jones Act, which is that when we see these attempts to try to pare it back, they tend to come from land, uh, senators representing landlocked states. John McCain of Arizona, uh, Lankford of Oklahoma. Again, back in the 90s, there was an attempt from a number of centers from, I think, Montana, Kansas, Indiana. Um, And I think this, again, speaks to the phenomenon of concentrated benefits and diffuse costs because maritime uh, states such as Alaska or Hawaii, which suffer the most from Jones Act, they're also home to a lot of uh, shipping interests because they're also maritime states. And so we have the bizarre phenomenon, for example, where Hawaii, you know, it's out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. They are 
perhaps even more dependent on imports than Puerto Rico is, and yet every member of their congressional delegation is a supporter of the Jones Act. It's frustrating. So what can be done to overcome these public choice obstacles in your view? That's a great question. Um, I think there's a few possibilities. One is that rather than going for whole scale repeal, you do something like granting a limited exemption uh, for Puerto Rico or for a certain area of Puerto Rico as if nothing else, we can portray it as an experiment and we can see, is this beneficial? Because the law has been in place for so long that it's hard to conceive almost of a world in which there is no Jones Act. And so we could do this and on a limited scale, see what the effects are. If the supporters of the Jones Act are correct in their assessment that this would have all kinds of negative effects, then we'll see that and then we can pull back. But if, you know, as I suspect, the benefits are, 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 you know, very significant, we would also see that. And then perhaps it would open the door to expand it to other places in the United States or just wholesale repeal. I think another possibility is to take aim at just part of the Jones Act. Like I said, it has four main provisions. I would be, I, I'd, I'd favor a bargain if we just got rid of, for example, the domestic build requirement and said, if you know any, you can buy a ship from anywhere in the world. Uh, you still have to staff it primarily with Americans and have it owned by Americans and registered here in the United States. That's fine, but you can buy it from anywhere and drop down the costs of buying these ships. We're talking about Puerto Rico a lot. Something worth noting is that you know Puerto Rico has the island of Vieques, and there are ferries that go back and forth from Vieques to uh, Puerto Rico. And, you know, those fall under the requirement that they have to be built in the United States. Again, that raises the costs for those ferries. It's unfair to the people of Puerto Rico. And a lot of those ferries are older and, and getting to the end of their useful life. And why are we putting this unnecessary burden on them? Why are we putting this unnecessary tax on them? So if we could repeal the domestic build requirement. I think that would go a long way towards alleviating all the burden that's been presented by the Jones Act. That's amazing. And I 100 percent agree. In fact, um, we could combine both those aspects. Like you said, create a startup society in this case, most likely a free trade zone because there's already a couple in Puerto Rico already, but also combining it with just a partial repeal of the Jones Act, except as part of the free trade zone concession. You say, look, uh, this small zone will have a repeal of a, par- of a portion of it, like the, like the building requirements. But if there is, if, if none of the negative side effects or few of the negative side effects are found as determined by an objective board, then we get to repeal another part of the Jones Act. So it rolls out in phases till you're at the point where you have the full repeal of the Jones Act in a particular area. And if that particular area does not go to hell in a handbasket, you do it for the whole island. Exactly, exactly. You know, if, you know, we can just do as an experiment. If people are really, you know, if this is truly rooted in national security in a sense of what's best for the United States, you know, they also say things like, well, Puerto Ricans won't have guaranteed service to the United States. There'll be cutbacks. They'll be subject to the vagaries of international shipping routes, which don't operate on regular schedules. If all this doom mongering is accurate, you know, again, just give it, you know, a few years. Let's see what happens. But, you know, there is no a willingness that I've detected on the part of Jones Act supporters to give one inch on this. And I think it's because they're scared. And I think it's because they realize that if the we give, if they, if they have to give just an inch that uh, they're going to have to end up conceding a whole lot more ground once we see the benefits of, of, of dialing back the Jones Act. So beyond even the Jones Act, a lot of people, they get a little scared when they hear about experimentation in the realm of politics, despite we need to experiment and change solutions in the 21st century. Where do you think that fear comes from? That's a, I think that people have an inherent status quo bias. Again, we've lived in a world where the Jones Act has always been around. And I think change is scary to people. Uh, I think we like having a predictable environment that we know and trust. And change, you know, people, I think uh, they're more scared of any possible costs than they are of benefits. We're very cost averse. Um, and I think that, you know, plays well uh, to the supporters of the Jones Act, that goes to their benefit because they can conjure up all kinds of fears and engage in this fear mongering. And of course, we can't point out the benefits until you know they're not realized until we get an opportunity to to enact these experiments. So yeah, I think it's just human nature to to be concerned with change, and and it's it's always difficult. 
you're right. They get to the per perverse advantage of saying, oh, this law has existed on the books. You're, you're destroying a uh, rule of law. You're making it difficult for businesses to plan, even though the Jones Act is inherently anti-market. Yeah, that's a good point. All right. Sorry, I'm drawing a blank here right yeah, now yeah, at the moment. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no worries. Take your time. Okay. Um, let's see where we can take the conversation from here, because you're not very comfortable talking about free trade zones. Um, what are some other elements of the Jones Act that would be useful to talk about at the moment? Okay. Um, well, I, I think it's it might also be worth pointing out that the Jones Act, I think, on its own terms, is a failure, um, because again, the whole reason it was built was to promote this maritime ecosystem in the United States that so we'd have, you know, these great shipyards that we could rely on in times of war. We would have merchant mariners to staff these ships and, and sail them in times of national emergency. Um, and none of that's come true. Uh, in fact, it's just the opposite. When we look at the state of uh, the U.S. maritime environment, the ecosystem, um, and I, of course I mean that in an industry sense, not literal ecosystem, um, it's doing very poorly. We see the number of shipyards on the decline. The number of ships are on the de decline. I believe, you know, over the last 15, 20 years, the number of Jones Act ships has declined by like uh, from by 50 percent, something like that, from 200 to roughly 100, something like that. Uh, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but we do know it's on the decline uh, significantly. Um, uh, we know that in times of war, for example, in the Gulf War, I think there was a total of maybe one Jones Act ship that actually went to, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, we know that foreign ships have been used by the U.S. military to carry goods to a theater of operations. So that justification uh, increasingly doesn't hold water. Um, also, there's the phenomenon of it's not just war. Um, not only does the Jones Act not help us, but it actually hinders us in national emergencies for example, the hurricane which hit uh, Puerto Rico, there was a struggle to get a waiver uh, for the Jones Act. President Trump ended up giving, I believe, a 10-day waiver, um, but that wasn't enough time to allow a lot of foreign ships that wanted to carry aid to Puerto Rico to get there. For example, Greenpeace had a ship that they loaded up with all kinds of uh, aid for Puerto Rico, including, I believe, solar panels. But all they had available was a ship that was built, I believe, in the, in the Netherlands. So they had to sail the ship from New York down to Florida and then transfer it to another ship to actually get it to Puerto Rico. Uh, and that costs more, which means they had less money to spend on aid. Uh, I believe in the port of New Orleans, there was a Norwegian ship that was available to transport goods and aid to Puerto Rico. But they couldn't leave the port in time to make it under that 10-day window. So these are you know, small examples, but they all add up. Wow, it's incredible. The Jones Act is actually a danger to national safety. Exactly, sure. exactly. I mean, that's that's the reason why, you know, it's not just uh, hurricanes, it's oil spills, things like that. If you want to clean up after an oil spill, you know, a lot of you need skimmers. Uh, so, for example, when there is a spill in the Gulf of Mexico, well, a lot of skimmers are up in Alaska uh, because that's where a lot of, you know, offshore oil uh, takes place. And there's, you know, the legacy of the Exxon Valdez and whatnot. And it's a, lo a lot easier just to bring in foreign skimmers than it is to bring them all the way down from Alaska. But because you got to go through this waiver process, um, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And so it, it, hinders, it hinders our responses. Now, you'll find some Jones Act supporters and they'll tell you, hey, it's fine. There's a waiver process. Um, but, you know, Keith Hennessy, who I believe was the chairman of the uh, Council of Economic Advisors under President George W. Bush, he made an interesting point. He said, you know, there's a lot of institutional bias against these Jones Act waivers. So he said, yeah, technically you can get a waiver. But it's kind of like, you know, a house on Halloween that has the light off and there's uh, some pit bulls in the front yard and they say, sure, we'll, we'll serve you candy. Um, you know, it's, it's not what it seems to be. And it's very difficult to get these waivers in many instances. So do you think now is the most ideal time to push for repeal the Jones Act after uh, Hurricane Maria? And why do you think so, if, if that is the case? <laughs> 
I do think so, because I think we have an ongoing and demonstrable cost of the Jones Act. We have an island that is struggling for multiple reasons, both because of the legacy of the hurricane, uh, as well as, you know, other factors um, to, to do with, you know, the government has problems. There, there's any number of problems that are currently facing Puerto Rico. And I think that your average citizen can understand the fact that we are putting this burden on them that they can ill afford. So we have Puerto Rico, unfortunately for Puerto Rico, they, they, they're kind of a poster child for the costs of the Jones Act. And I think it's very visible and people can understand that, that everything, it's an island, they need to import you know, much of what they consume and they have to pay higher costs for that. So I think that that's understandable to people. Also, I think, you know, the fact that we're heading towards the 100 year anniversary of the Jones Act also helps because we can say this is a law. It's antiquated. It's been around forever. It's no longer in tune with modern realities. Like I said, when it comes to warfare, that's totally changed. When it comes to how ships are built, you know, 100 years ago, they were not being built in Japan, China, South Korea. Now they are. They're much cheaper. So it's just it's a rule that was written for a world that has long passed us by. And I think that people can maybe understand that after 100 years, if nothing else, we should be willing to revisit laws and just re-examine them. If nothing else, there should be a debate held over that. There's nothing wrong with a debate. And if the supporters of the Jones Act are as confident in the law as they claim to be, they should welcome the scrutiny. So I think uh, that both those factors perhaps give a cautious case for optimism. Excellent. Yeah, it's time to debate and to experiment with uh, repeals or uh, changes to the Jones Act. I totally agree. Everyone, that was Colin. Uh, feel free to hear him talk at the Star Society Summit, May 9th to the 10th at George Mason University. The topic is about uh, startup cities, blockchain technology, and uh, green infrastructure can help rebuild the island in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Colin, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.